Hey guys, I'm giving speeches. I'll be at the Connecticut Libertarian Party State Convention on January the 29th and then February the 26th at the state convention in Utah in Salt Lake City there. So I don't know. Look it up. All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of antiwar.com, author of the book, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy, and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there, and the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, y'all. Introducing Darren J. Beatty from Revolver.News. Welcome back to the show. How you doing? Great to be back here. Thanks for having me. Uh, happy to have you here. So uh, you had written these two great stories about uh, Ray Epps and other mysterious men involved in a seemingly organized plot to foment the January 6th uh, riot at the Capitol in 2021. And then uh, there have been some developments since then. Stuart Rhodes has been indicted, and not just for trespassing and low-level charges like most of the others here, but he and his guys have been indicted for seditious conspiracy. And so, Mm -hmm. um, and then also I talked with uh, Ken Bensinger, uh, Bensinger, on the show from BuzzFeed, and he, of course, had done the great reporting about the bogus Michigan kidnap plot there. Yep. Um, And so I asked him for his take on whether he thought there were informants in the January 6th thing and whether Stuart Rhodes was one, et cetera, and what he had thought of your articles, and he had some comments about that, and I know you heard that. So I brought you on to, um, to discuss both of those things. I guess, can we start with, does the Rhodes arrest and, and the other guys with him, does that include any or many of the people that you had written about? Or is that a separate issue? And does it change your opinion of, uh, you know, your speculation of what was likely possibly, or I guess however you phrased it, behind the lack of arrest of those men that you had identified and the speculation that they were possibly federal informants? Yeah, no, that's a it's a great question, and it's a great opportunity to clarify for, I think, a lot of people, some of whom, you know, just kind of casually digested our reporting, and others whose job it is to be on top of these things, like, uh, what's his name, Ken Bensinger, the BuzzFeed guy, who should know better. Um, and the argument that, the the sense that our reporting was essentially saying, um, X person is not indicted up to this point, therefore he's a Fed, and then and that's that this thesis is falsifiable up to the point that anyone's indicted is absolutely ridiculous. The underlying questions pertaining to Stuart Rhodes that catalyzed a reporting originally are only intensified in light of Rhodes's recent arrest. They are not dissolved or discredited. And let me just recapitulate what those questions are. So um, basically what happened is there are the original Oath Keepers defendants for the most part. They got hit with a superseding indictment that includes seditious conspiracy. And Rhodes, the founder and leader of the Oath Keepers, was added to the indictment. That's what's happened. So the the other people, the co-defendants, save for maybe one or two, but for the most part, the co-defendants, they've been charged since the beginning just for the lesser charge of conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. And this charge, with the addition of Rhodes, includes a superseding indictment of seditious conspiracy. That's or one point. Uh, does that make sense so sure. far? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So... So the question that really animated uh, our reporting on Rhodes, in addition to all his sort of background stuff, but the real questions that are intensified in light of his uh, arrest 
and which need some explanation. And again, my position is still very strongly that these questions demand explanation and the best explanation thus far in light of the evidence that we have is still that Rhodes is being protected. Those questions are as follows. Why take an entire year to indict him for anything? Now, the either the disingenuous or the, frankly, ignorant and low information response to that would be, oh, well, you know, for, for a serious charge like seditious conspiracy, they just need to build up a really strong case, and that could take an entire year. Nonsense. First of all, they didn't need a seditious conspiracy charge to indict Stuart Rhodes. They indicted, as we point out in our reporting, mid-January, they indicted Thomas Caldwell for conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. And the indictment and entire conspiracy, if you look at the charging documents, point to Stuart Rhodes's statements and actions as the person who initiated the conspiracy. And so if they felt that that was enough to indict Caldwell from the very beginning, then that was enough to indict Rhodes for the lesser charge of conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. And by doing so, they would have taken Rhodes off the street, since he's this apparent danger, taken him off the street, and they could have waited to build a superseding indictment with the additional leverage over him of having him indicted for a lesser charge. And yet, so the question is, why, if, if the government was just building this big seditious conspiracy case over an entire year, why did they forego the easy layup indictments of either conspiracy to obstruct, which they hit others with, his co-defendants with very early on, and trespassing? Why forego the opportunity for a lesser indictment and wait an entire year where he could have been a flight risk, where he could have done anything? He could have been a danger or a flight risk. Why? And in fact, this isn't just a question that I'm re-upping, that I'm re-engaging with in light of this arrest. This is actually now the very question proposed by Stuart Rhodes's defense. Because now the prosecution is acting as though, okay, we want to, we want to, we're doing a pretrial hearing and we want to keep Rhodes in prison because he's such a danger. And Rhodes's attorney says, quite reasonably, if he was such a danger, why the hell did you wait an entire year to arrest him with anything? Why did you keep him on the streets for an entire year when all these other people you hit with trespassing charges and lesser charges? Why? No adequate explanation for that whatsoever. So that's one question that remains unanswered. And I think my answer is still overwhelmingly the most parsimonious and powerful and persuasive answer to that. Another question that I think is even more bizarre and inexplicable and devoid of any kind of innocent conventional explanation is this. So one thing that they bizarrely decided not to charge him with anything and waited a whole year. It's quite another that they didn't even search him. Okay. The asterisk to that is that they searched him four months after January 6, taking a single cell phone from Stuart Rhodes. They give him four months, this guy who's so serious that they're allegedly holding everything off to build this grand seditious conspiracy case over a year. He's so serious, he's so important. They're just spending all of their time to cross, you know, cross the T's, dot the I's, do everything. And he's not even important enough for them to search. They wait four months to allow him to destroy any evidence that could be useful in their big important ultimately year-long seditious conspiracy investigation. And then at the end of four months, they take a single phone. 
Whereas Rhodes is on record in interviews talking about quote unquote OPSEC, burner phones, so forth. It's mm-hmm. not as though he could have had any additional phones, right? Well, and they're claiming so they the indictment it. that he stopped and bought a bunch of firearms on the way to DC and this kind of thing. So it seems like the, those would be on the well, no? Well, or they should no. be. I mean, that, that would have, uh, they, the search warrant, as far as it's been publicly reported, and as far as anyone has ever said, as far as I've been able to confirm from any of the defense attorneys, anything, is that they took a single cell phone from him four months after January 6th. Mm-hmm. And then after that single search in May, they wait an additional eight months of no search? That is inconceivable. Let me tell you what they did, just the, the, the standard procedure, what they did to Thomas Caldwell. What they did to Thomas Caldwell, who again was hit with this lesser conspiracy charge in mid-January with the charge all teed up and ready to go, uh, you know, that the charge that was based almost exclusively on Rhodes' own statements and actions, the feds give him the full treatment. The feds bust down his door, stick a gun in his face, stick a gun in his wife's face, raid his entire place, take every electronic imaginable. That's how, and, and they do it. They don't wait four months to do it. They did it just weeks after January 6th. That's what it looks like when they're seriously trying to collect evidence on someone. And yet for some bizarre reason, maybe the same reason that the feds decided not to charge Rhodes at all for an entire year when they could have gotten him on multiple charges that they gave other lower profile people, they decide to not even search him. They, They give him four months to destroy evidence. And he's been on, you know, interviews saying like, oh yeah, use burner phones, do this or do that. He's, they give him four months to destroy evidence. They take a single cell phone and then they give him an additional eight months to destroy evidence. Yeah. So, well, it, you know, on the other it, hand, you'd think that if he really was an informant, they would do a better job of pretending that he wasn't or something that they'd go ahead and do a, so? a, a, so? a larger search for performance reasons only, if only. Look, there. If it weren't for Revolver News, nobody would even be thinking about this. They weren't expecting Stuart Rhodes to become an issue at all. They weren't expecting the narrative of January 6th being a potential Fed operation to become a thing at all. They were expecting it for good reason, because they want just kind of loyal lapdogs like the BuzzFeed guy who will, you know, report some things, but do very, very aggressive sort of narrative guard walling to make sure no one asks these additional questions, which are frankly obvious. And we can get into that in the future. They weren't expecting people to ask these questions. And for the most part, you know, they were right to do so. And so they take a single cell phone and guess what? They don't want a the full range of his communications, because the less they collect, the less liability it is. Because to the extent that they're collecting his communications and his burner phones or whatever he may have been using to communicate to anyone, that becomes evidence that under um, Brady rules and other rules, the prosecution is obliged to turn over to the defense. And in fact, it's on the basis of leaked text messages that in many cases in the, the Michigan issue, that's how the, you know, the informants got revealed. And so the less electronic communication they collect, the better off they are. Yeah. And, now, we haven't just, heard, have we heard from his lawyer? I mean, obviously it would be, you know, a card that he might be waiting to play, but uh, his lawyer hasn't said yet that, hey, whatever Stewart did, he did so in full cooperation with the FBI, so leave him alone, which might be an obvious thing to say if his client is sitting in jail right now, right? Well, no, it wouldn't. It would be an obvious thing to say if these charges were genuine and Rhodes thought he was being burned. Yeah, like it's, if he was really going not, to prison. I could see them waiting not, to play that one, it, but it, it, I'm just yeah, asking. We don't not, have any indication from his camp, though, that that's his defense yet, right? No, and I think it's fully likely that there'll be some other cover stories to why these charges are not, you know, pursued to Rhodes going to prison. There are a number of other 
options that they could have to say, they might say, oh, you know what? Rhodes is cooperating. He's telling us, you know, things that we want to know right. about Alex Jones or Roger Stone or the Trump inner circle. And so we're going to give him a pass and, mm -hmm. you know, ease up on these charges. And he'll ultimately do like four months in prison, if that. So now there going back to your articles here, I mean, this guy Epps, you demonstrate is a partner with Rhodes going back. And so I guess back to one of my original questions there, which I asked you too many questions at once at the beginning, was how much overlap is there between the mysterious men you identified in the videos and in your reporting there uh, and the men in the indictment accused yep. by the government? At least one of those guys it's is indicted question. with Rose, right? Yep, it's a good question. Let, let me get to that. But first, let me address the question of why isn't Rhodes at this point saying, wait a minute, the, the government, you're charging me with seditious conspiracy. What the hell? I was working for you the whole time. And again, that does happen. There is precedent for that sort of thing happening where informants get, get burned. I don't think that that's the case yet with Rhodes. I think the feds have a very delicate game to play. I think if they spook him too much, that could be a possibility. I don't think we're there yet. I think that this indictment occurred on the basis of some kind of understanding that one way or another, the indictment looks serious. It accomplishes many things that the government wants to accomplish, but ultimately Rhodes is still being protected or from his perspective, he's still being protected. It might not be the case from the Fed's perspective, but from his perspective, he's still being protected and the charges aren't serious and he's not ready to go nuclear. But interestingly enough, there have been interviews with Rhodes in which he evoked this concept of, you know what, if the feds come after me, we're going to go through discovery and they're going to be screwed, which is a very weird thing to say in the context of a criminal indictment that he was contemplating. Mm -hmm. Discovery is usually something that people use in that context for like civil suits and so forth. To say discovery could be bad for the government if they decide to charge him is an interesting thing to say, to be the least. Well, it's kind of a this is spec just this sort of is a truism, right, Darren, that if someone is a compromised FBI informant or flip state's witness, that mm -hmm. in a sense, depending on what it is that they do, they could have compromised the FBI right back. Right. So somebody who's been turned into an informant who then goes and robs exactly. a bunch of banks called, or something like that. He makes it's his leverage. handlers look bad for him getting away with oh, that on their watch. No, no, no. Think about this. If it turns out that, again, that the best explanation for the questions that I raised, why it was protected for a whole year from search and any you know lesser indictment, is that he has some relationship with the government that you know they don't want to be known, that's hugely embarrassing to them, right. especially because Rhodes is not just anybody. Rhodes is the founder and leader of the Oath Keepers, which is the most prosecuted militia group imputed to 1-6, which is responsible with for this whole stupid stack thing mm -hmm. that the media has been amplifying since day one as evidence of the most dangerous insurrection-y aspect of 1-6. Right. If it turns out that the the head of this whole militia organization was effectively a Fed, whether formally or informally through cutouts or some kind of arrangement. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely devastating. Right. To and for the, the critics, you know, critics might say, well, you're just, you know, going too far in the speculation here. But I don't think you're necessarily implying that the feds had orchestrated his actions that day, but just that if he was working for them while he was doing that, that would be enough to cover up right there. There are a range of possibilities, and that's in the speculative territory. What I'm confident in saying is that the most reasonable and likely explanation for the questions that I raise pertaining to the bizarre discrepancies in the treatment of roads for the entire year is that he's being protected by the government and he's because he has some type of arrangement with some federal agency. And that doesn't even mean that he's directly working for them. It could mean that there's an understanding whereby he regularly uh, gives them information in exchange for protection. Maybe he's working for some kind of cutout. There are a lot of arrangements that could sustain that basic position. 
but still I'm even more so in light of his indictment convinced absent any alternative explanation for those two questions that I raised. And additionally, so given his background of, you know, basically injecting himself into these types of events and coming out unscathed when multiple people around him are indicted. Um, this is, I think, the most powerful and reasonable explanation for it. And I don't think that Rhodes is being burned at this point. I don't think he thinks of himself as being burned. If he thought that and he were brave, he would go rogue and potentially use his the leverage that he might have on the government in terms of what his relationship actually was. So in that sense, at this stage, I think it's more likely than not that these seditious conspiracy charges are not genuine in the sense that there's no serious intention of putting him in jail for the 20 years that you know attaches to this. There's an understanding that, look, this is for show. This is for the headline. There'll be some public story that accounts for why they don't ultimately pursue these serious charges to put him in jail. He might end up serving four months for some lesser thing. The public story might be that he's cooperating against a Trump inner circle. There are other potential stories, but I don't think Rhodes thinks of himself as being burned at this point, because if he did, I think it would be likely that he would, um, he would use the leverage that I think he has. Yeah. Hang on just one second. Hey, y'all, the audiobook of my book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, is finally done. Yes, of course, read by me. It's available at Audible, Amazon, Apple Books, and soon on Google Play and whatever other options there are out there. It's my history of America's war on terrorism from 1979 through today. Give it a listen and see if you agree. It's time to just come home. Enough already. Time to end the war on terrorism. The audiobook. Hey guys, I've had a lot of great webmasters over the years, but the team at expanddesigns.com have by far been the most competent and reliable. Harley Abbott and his team have made great sites for the show and the Institute, and they keep them running well, suggesting and making improvements all along. Make a deal with expanddesigns.com for your new business or news site. They will take care of you. Use the promo code SCOTT and save $500. That's expanddesigns.com. Hey guys, Scott Horton here for Listen and Think Libertarian Audiobooks. As you may know, the audiobook of my new book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism, is finally out. It's co-produced by our longtime friends at Listen and Think Libertarian Audiobooks. For many years now, Derek Sheriff over there at Listen and Think has offered lifetime subscriptions to anyone who donates $100 or more to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate or to the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org slash donate. And they've got a bunch of great titles, including Inside Syria by the late, great Reese Ehrlich. That's listenandthink.com. Now, uh, okay, back to the question of the overlap here between the guys you identified in your articles and right. the guys in the new indictment here. Right. Okay, so the thing with apps is I, I view these as two different dimensions of the same larger story. Again, this I want to be careful to, to say that this is purely speculative on my part, but my intuition, my gut says, I don't think that Ray Epps and were coordinating. Um, Ray Epps was a president of the Arizona chapter of the Oath Keepers many, many, many years ago. Um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Rhodes and Epps did not maintain kind of close relationship at all. I think it's quite possible that Rhodes and Epps were acting more or less independently, but in effect in concert because Rhodes and Epps played different roles. Rhodes is the head of the Oath Keepers who um, in some way, or I should say just allegedly now to be careful, but in some way would have been associated with the QRF stuff and associated with the stack stuff because it was the Oath Keepers who did, who did the stack. Whereas Ray Epps and his quote unquote breach team were cataloged extensively and uh, in detail, you know, a lot of video stuff in the revolver piece. They were responsible in two things. 
taking down the barriers to create this booby trap situation where the whole crowd technically trespasses without even knowing it yet. And secondly, in the case of Scaffold Commander, who remains unindicted, un unidentified even, which is interesting, um, people like that to mobilize the crowd, they have their bullhorns, they're saying, move forward, move forward, move forward, and use crowd control techniques to help to engineer proximity to the capital and the ultimate penetration of the capital. So I think that uh, Epps and Rhodes played quite different but complementary um, roles. And it's not necessarily my working hypothesis that they're you know, in cahoots or coordinating or anything like that. I think it's just as likely, maybe more likely that while you know, they knew each other when Epps was president of Arizona chapter, um, that they just hadn't been in contact for several years at the at the time that January 6 occurred. Mm -hmm. And then so now when you talk about the stacks and this and that, those are the guys in the indictment are clearly tied to Rhodes and and man for man are separate from the group that you identified in your stories. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that's a different component of the story. Mm -hmm. Like just again, speaking in generalities, but to help people get a broad sense of the pictures, Ray Epps and his team um, allegedly appear to have coordinated the initial breach of the Capitol grounds to the, create the conditions that would allow for the ultimate penetration of the Capitol, whereas uh, the Oath Keepers group, that's associated with the QRF and some of the the scary gun stuff, mm -hmm. and also the stack that the media has made such a big deal about. All right. Okay, now, one of those guys, am I right? Uh, one of the guys who seemed to be associated with Epps has also been indicted. Am I right? It was the guy that he whispered in his ear, go now, or whatever it was, and the guy charged the cops and the bike racks there. Is that correct? Well, there are two people, um, that, uh, at least two people, like, you know, depends what you mean by associated. But there are two people that I think are relevant who were part, you know, kind of coordinating um with apps working with apps um, that one guy is Ryan Samsell and he's the person that Epps whispers into his ear. And then two seconds later, he uh, breaks down that barricade at 1253 PM. Ryan Samsell was indicted and he's served time. He's been in prison and he's actually, I think I mentioned this last uh, time in your program He's actually been really brutalized. And I would say, you know, he certainly acted in an imprudent way on, on January 6th. I think that's fair to say. But, you know, we're not in some, you know, I don't want this to be some kind of Abu Ghraib type, you know, country where people are just brutalized in prison like that. And so I, I think uh, the treatment of Sam Cell has been shameful. And even though he was imprudent on that day, um, you know, he doesn't, nobody deserves to be brutalized in prison. And yeah. so, um, and by the way, he's keeping a very, very tight hold on what Ray Epps whispered in his ear. Wouldn't, wouldn't we all like to know what that was, but he's well, keep, keep, all keeping might be, a very tight hold you on might that. be abusing the term all there. I mean, possibly some of us want to know, but some of us don't. Sure. I mean, Okay. And the, there's another uh, individual um, uh, called Maroon uh, Proud Boy, uh, who's also an interesting case. And again, like for, for Epps, so the guy he whispers in his ear, that's Ryan Samsell. There's another guy who is really uh, an egregious case. And Epps says to him, he says, when we go in, leave this here. We don't want to get shot. Right. Now that remark alone is quite something given the history of prosecutions and indictments. An individual called George Tanios, I think I mentioned him, he was facing 50 years or something crazy for a conspiracy to assault an officer, might have even been a more serious charge. And the overt act in this in George Tanios's conspiracy was saying no, no, not yet when his friend tried to reach for his bear spray. The yet part constituted the overt act. Whereas Ray Epps, who says, when we go in, leave this here, 
I mean, it, it the parallels are are striking in right. addition to all the other evidence on Epps. But yeah. for Epps, I think it's uh, we can talk about the Epps case separately and the kind of pathetic uh, damage control tour that the government's trying to do through the January 6th committee and and so forth. But well, I mean, um, and this is my point. I wasn't just trying to be cute there about who's not interested in what the previous gentleman has to say here. The obvious yep. thing would be if if we're just talking about a random prosecutor with no agenda here, they would be using these two men to implicate the third. And in this case, there's no indication. I think you said this guy's already pleaded guilty and been sent to prison and was not made to turn against Epps or apparently anyone well, else. Well, I don't think he's pled guilty. I think he, oh, like he was convicted? many of the other people in the January 6th gulag, so he's just been held in pretrial detention. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said he was yeah. in prison as opposed to in jail. Sorry, yeah, that so was, I'm sorry, I was misunderstood you there. there. I see what you mean, yeah. Um, but, which is also, you know, in violation of their right to a speedy trial and all that. And in fact, I don't know no, if there you've really covered this. there are all these violations here. That's a whole other right. aspect of this uh of this um real uh, scandalous situation right. um but i think we're focused on the in some ways the most you know the, the the juicy part which is the uh federal involvement question and on that note maybe we can turn in more detail uh and i can address uh some of the uh remarks of a previous guest of yours the the buzzfeed guy yeah in fact before and you do i wanted to say darren that you know, I'm a nonpartisan type kind of guy here. And my point of view is that you guys are kind of both sort of rude in the way that he talked about you. And I guess you guys have a history going back and whatever. But the way I look at it was that you're, you know, being honest and upfront and saying, I've identified some serious questions that remain unanswered, but that also, you know, obviously give rise to speculative questions about what the answer might be as a working hypothesis, it's not like you're going off making claims that you can't back up. While on the other hand, he's saying, well, I'm just not in the business of asking questions that I don't know the answer to yet. My journalism is different than that. And I'll leave that to him. So he was kind of talking smack while he said that. But I think that your writing and his writing are both are both kind of perfectly legitimate ways of going about it. Yeah. Um, well, and, no, and I don't really I, see too big of, of, a, of a split there. So he might, I think he was being unfair in saying that you were asking unfair questions, but, uh, at the same well, time, I don't think that he was really wrong to say that, well, look, I'll start calling people informants as soon as I have evidence that they're informants rather than just speculative, you know, informed questions. Right. Right. Well, look. I, I appreciate your your diplomacy in the matter, and um, I will proceed to address his remarks in in a manner that has exactly the amount of di you know diplomacy that I think is is due um, on on the occasion. Um, so, and I wish we could play you know some of his his remarks. Some of it. I have the interview up and I'll want to play it, but some of it I can just paraphrase and you can kind of um, correct me if I'm not representing it um, accurately. Um, but let's, let's talk about some key components. One thing he was saying, first of all, is um, he was saying that, you know what, there's no evidence big issue, I think the first thing that again, kind of, I don't know if there's an antagonism, but I kind of, um, I guess, trolled him a little bit for what I think he's got to be either disingenuous or some kind of weird robot mind to not make any type of link between the Michigan case and January 6. And so just, and he's been very emphatic on, you know, just building this epistemic wall, <laughs> you know, saying, you know, now that now that the cat's out of the bag already with the Michigan case, and let's be clear of the timeline here. He says, oh, what Revolve is reporting on our stuff. Nope. We talked about the Michigan case before BuzzFeed did. The only outlet that was talking about the Michigan case in any context who actually covered it quite well albeit not 
as extensively as BuzzFeed uh, ended up doing was Jacobin. Jacobin covered the Michigan case and covered it pretty fairly and pretty reasonably and said, look, this, this looks like an entrapment issue, a lot like what they were doing to the Muslims in the war on, war on terror. Revolver News picked that up, covered the Michigan case, added to it, and situated it contextually in relation to January 6. Now, this is in the view of the uh, objective neutrality man BuzzFeed, which, by the way, is a kind of blog that I think got its name from doing like cat listicles and things. So very serious outlet there. But in, in the, the view of Mr. from the Mount Olympus of cat, you know, cat food listicle BuzzFeed, the inferential step that is to be avoided at all costs is linking the Michigan case to January 6, when one, it involves one of the three same major militia groups involved in both cases, when two, even though it's colloquially referred to as a kidnapping plot, there was a plot to storm the Michigan state capitol. So you have this plot to storm a capitol, you have one of the same militia groups, and as Revolver was the first to point out, contra BuzzFeed's claim that we're not doing any original reporting on this, as we were the first to point out, the head of the Detroit field office who oversaw that went on immediately after to oversee January 6 prosecutions. So you have the same militia group, which was fed infiltrated up the wazoo in Michigan. You have the same plot to storm state capital, and you have the same guy playing a major role in overseeing both incidents. And you have the events occurring just months apart. And in the Michigan case, you have a Fed infiltration ratio that turns out to be like 12 out of 26. And so I don't think it's any kind of far-flung exercise of kind of tinfoil speculation to say, gee, maybe there are some parallels here. And in fact, in a recent New York Times piece on the Michigan case, they bring one of their experts who says, yeah, there, there are parallels there. And so I think the aggressiveness and the insistence of BuzzFeed, again, BuzzFeed didn't break the story that they're a bunch of informants. Once the cat was out of the bag, that the Michigan case was totally just messed up and uh, you know just a cluster with all of these informants and agents who are doing weird stuff on the side such that they're not even able to testify. Once that was already out of the bag a little bit, then BuzzFeed came along to provide additional detail, but in addition say, wait a minute, guys, you better not make any inferences to January 6th because these are totally different issues, right? And you have to be, you know, uh, and, and, and at the Mount Olympus of uh, uh, cat uh, listicle journalism that is BuzzFeed, we wouldn't dare make any inferences of that sort. But we will say pretty confidently that there's no connection. And we will say pretty confidently that January 6 had nothing of the sort because it's okay to make speculative inferences, even uh, extremely unlikely ones, so long as they're in the direction of the government's position. So, so that's one thing I'll say about that. I mean, the, this, this fiction that is really selectively um, practiced, that's promoted by this, this BuzzFeed guy that, oh, you know, they're involved in speculation. We're just in facts. I just need the document right in front of me. There's no such thing as facts mean nothing without a narrative, without making sense of how they link together, without telling a story, without making some inferences as to the motivations, without looking at historical parallels and everything like that. If, if you're just in the business of copy and pasting facts that maybe, you know, government sources give you, you're not doing journalism. You're doing damage control. Sorry. Hang on just one second. Hey, guys, anybody who signs up to listen to this show by way of Patreon will be invited to join the Reddit group. 
And I'm going to start posting stuff over there more. That's patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. Thanks. Hey, y'all, LibertasBella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. You guys, check it out. This is so cool. The great Mike Swanson's new book is finally out. He's been working on this thing for years. And I admit, I haven't read it yet. I'm going to get to it as soon as I can. But I know you guys are going to want to beat me to it. It's called Why the Vietnam War? Nuclear Bombs and Nation Building in Southeast Asia, 1945 through 61. And as he explains on the back here, all of our popular culture and our retellings and our history and our movies are all about the height of the American war there in, say, 1964 through 1974. But how do we get there? Why is this all Harry Truman's fault? Find out in Why the Vietnam War by the great Mike Swanson. Available now. Well, so a huge part of it is just knowing which questions to ask or which documents right. to try to get. Exactly. I mean, exactly. whether people so, are informants or not, is that a question or isn't that a question? So it's pretty important. So the idea that... But it's not just asking it in a vacuum. Right. It's asking with extremely concrete context, which I just adduced. Yeah. So and if, it's also if, if, pretty obvious here too, Darren, that for what did happen that day and for the deal that's been made out of it, where, you know, the Republic almost fell that day and all this stuff as yeah, the way no, TV it's, it's portrays ridiculous. it. It's pretty it's, clear why they would clamp down as hard as they could on things, any information these about These two it. things happened just months you know, within a month's span of each other. So again, the the idea that we don't want to make any connections between the Michigan thing and the January 6th thing, again, and that's not the argument that arrests. I do, you know, analysis specifically on January 6th, but to pretend like the Michigan case that involves one of the same militia groups that involves the same plot to storm state capital that had one of the same guys who played an active role in, in both. One is the head of the Detroit field office who went on to oversee January 6 investigation. And in one, you have a f fed infiltration ratio of 12 out of 26. And to pretend that that doesn't shed any valuable context on January 6 is you either have to be incredibly disingenuous or just an idiot. Yeah. And you can take your pick Fair as enough. to which one um, the, the Buzzfeed guy is. And so that's, that's one part that I wanted to cover. The other part is, again, it's either, you know, disingenuous or just a, maybe an IQ problem, cognitive problem of representing the argument of revolvers as to say, it's as simple as saying, oh, so-and-so is not indicted at this particular time. Therefore he's a fed in such a way that if this person is, is indicted the next day, that sort of falsifies the entire thesis. That was never the argument. And for, um, I keep forgetting his name, but I, so I call him the Buzzfeed guy, but Ken, for, for Ken, Bensinger. Guy, Ken Bensinger, for, for, for Bensinger to say, Oh yeah, you know, revolvers just, their argument was this guy, Stuart Rhodes wasn't arrested. Therefore not give me a break. I, it's very clear. It doesn't take, um, it doesn't take, you know, it's, it's a little bit higher than the Buzzfeed level of, you know, reading comprehension, but it doesn't require a genius to understand what the revolver article was if someone actually read it. And what it was is raising the questions that I just, um, recapitulated to you earlier, which is why did they take so long and why didn't they search him? And these are questions that even came up with no adequate answer in the pretrial hearing for Rhodes himself. And, and these are questions that, you know, first of all, it seems like Bensinger is not interested in. And second of all, he disingenuously um, ignores those questions and pretends like, oh, Revolver was simply saying this guy is not arrested, therefore, he, uh, therefore he's a Fed, which was never the argument. Yeah. Um, Although thirdly, part of that just, part of that might have been somewhat my fault in terms of me sort of paraphrasing your argument as I put it to him. Maybe so I'll but take, again, you know, at least partial responsibility job, for that. Maybe. This guy's job is to be on top of all this stuff and to read this stuff. Revolver's probably, I'd say, not even controversial to say that Revolver's done more than any other news media outlet to 
kind of advance the you know national conversation on this question. And so even if he thinks we're not up to the journalistic standards of cat listicles, it's his professional obligation to be on top of our reporting and to represent it accurately. And if he thinks that there's a compelling alternative explanation to our working hypothesis, then it's, you know, it's it's his invitation to provide that, which of course, um, which of course he didn't do. Another thing that I think is interesting about how he approached the issues, just to give him a, give a sense of how either disingenuous or just kind of um, uh, out to lunch he is, or just kind of disconnected, or maybe frankly. He's a lot better than he seems, but this is just the pound of flesh he has to give in order for BuzzFeed to allow him to, to continue writing because BuzzFeed isn't his media outlet in the way that Revolver is mine. So maybe he needs to give the pound of flesh and play the game in order to keep his job. That's also a possibility. But for, but for him to say, oh, you know, in the, in the case of uh, you know, Michigan, unlike the cases where there are poor defenseless Muslims there, in this case, there are people with like, you know, more privilege or something like the people who were in all likelihood entrapped in the Michigan case were like completely destitute. There's zero privilege whatsoever. So, so to pretend like this is some different case where um, uh, the uh, defendants in the Michigan case are somehow uh, more pri privileged or less sympathetic than the case of the Muslims in War and Terror, that I think belies a certain um, bias that he brings to the table in analyzing these things. And it's a bias that I think is reinforced by his really um, uh, absurd remark that he says, there's no evidence whatsoever that any of this stuff is politically motivated when the one of the FBI agents in the Michigan case, who is such a stand up guy, he uh, this is the quality of person, by the way, that the FBI hires to run these operations is he was arrested for you know beating the hell out of his wife on the way back from a swingers party. But he's on social media, just like going off on Trump, going off on all these things. And so and, you know, that's not to mention the whole contextual history of what the FBI and you know the CIA and other agencies were doing post election, which is to say, you know, these are not organizations that are institutionally aligned uh, with Trump at all. So for him to avoid the political side, again, not a huge issue, but I think it speaks to some of the biases that he brings to the table, whether he believes them or not. Maybe it's just that BuzzFeed requires it. But then a last thing that I think is really the cherry on top is this, is that after BuzzFeed Bensinger, we'll just call him BuzzFeed Bensinger, after BuzzFeed Bensinger goes off on saying, you know what, I'm offended, Scott, that you would suggest that we're on the same level, which we're not. I mean, Revolver's far superior to, to, to what he does, but he says to... How dare you, Scott, suggest that Revolver and, uh, and I are the same level? I engage in serious original reporting uh, at BuzzFeed, and Revolver just does speculation and doesn't engage in facts. And then immediately after that, he dismisses his inaccurately characterized position of what our reporting has been on Rhodes to say, Darren Beatty has a personal vendetta against Rhodes because in 2014, he was at the Bundy Ranch and all this. I was never at the Bundy Ranch. He just goes on to make a completely false statement based on inaccurate information. And again, like if I wanted to, I could probably, you know, get do legal action against him, but I'm not, you know, probably not going to do that. But at the same time, I think that's the sort of thing that demands a formal correction on his part for him to literally go on right after saying that he engages in facts. And he's this careful, objective guy who only brings the best and highest quality objective um, uh, uh, journalism to, the, to, to, you know, that belongs next to the cat listicles. And then he goes on to say, oh, Darren Beatty just has an ag agenda against Stuart Rhodes because he was at the Bundy Ranch and he feels, no, I wasn't at the Bundy Ranch. Well, I've do you have any previous relationship with Rhodes at all? 
zero. I never heard of this guy before I started looking at the charging documents for the Oath Keepers cases. I never even heard of the guy. And and uh, and the the BuzzFeed guy says I was part of, you know, basically suggests or explicitly says, that, you know, I was at Bundy Ranch as part of all this weird malicious stuff in 2014. And that's why I have this vendetta. No, man, you must be confusing me for someone else. And so he's going to have to issue a formal correction uh, just for the record, because I, you know, I don't want some journalist, you know, being on the record saying that I was involved in weird malicious stuff when I wasn't um, in 2014. And secondly, it's just such a beautiful encapsulation of how fake and disingenuous this guy is uh, for him to engage in this egregious factual mischaracterization right after huffing and puffing about how he's on a different level from revolver because he engages in facts and not speculation. Yeah. It's just, you can't make this up. You know, snobbery never works out. It always backfires. Just like if on Twitter, you call somebody stupid, there's always a typo in it. You know, it just doesn't ever work. It doesn't, Universe it won't doesn't allow it. work. It doesn't work. And especially like, you know, I can appreciate snobbery in the rare cases when someone has something to be snobby about. But in the case of this guy, he's, you know, he's he's engaging in disingenuous arguments or just cognitively deficient arguments throughout. And I've addressed these point by point. And then he encapsulates it with this totally factually inaccurate thing. Yeah. And he works for BuzzFeed, for God's sake. So I, I do think it's incumbent on him, both from a legal perspective and simply from a journalistic ethics perspective, he should um, do the right thing and issue, you know, tail between the legs, whatever. I won't spike the football too much, but I do think it's incumbent on him to issue a formal uh, correction to his remark, clarifying that, I wasn't at Bundy Ranch in 2014. Any of that weird stuff that he um, really directly uh, imputed to me in order to discredit his mischaracterization of my reporting on Stuart Rhodes. So I so I hope he does that, and we don't have to kind of take it to any more aggressive level because you know I I do think in his own little sphere he does interesting work and valuable work. Like I think. It's probably for a purpose of damage control because he's so aggressively and frankly inadequately attempting to police like the the uh, contours of the narrative, basically saying, yeah, we know that the Michigan case was Fed infiltrated up the wazoo, but come on, you know, you got to be an objective reporter and not use, you know, not avail yourself of the gift of logical inference and just, you know, report um, isolated facts as they're given to you and don't connect any of the dots and just like completely abandon uh, any kind of narrative or context or common sense. Well, you or... know, Darren, I think he probably will retract that particular claim because that was obviously just a careless mistake there that he had confused you for somebody else or something like that. Right. So that no, should be an easy one was... for him to walk back, if nothing else. I don't think it was malicious. I, I think it was it was too dumb to have been malicious. It was, if it was malicious, it would probably have been more sophisticated. It was just a simple, sloppy, careless mistake that frankly is a Buzzfeed tier mistake, but it, it totally, um, you know, flies in the face of the posture that he adopted, you know, immediately before that. So I almost think that there's a poetic quality to it to, for him to, um, to culminate his series of misrepresentations and uh, kind of ignorance on on my reporting and the issue with it, just a blatant factual um, mischaracterization that was an attempt to discredit uh, my work. So enough about him. There's really no bad blood, you know. I yeah, I don't I don't really care about him either way. I think his reporting again in its own really narrow little playpen, you know, his, he does a good job within the playpen that Buzzfeed gives him. And I, you know, I commend him for the good job in his playpen. All right, man. Well, back to the story here. I think anybody knows that the department of justice, you think is, I was going too easy on this guy or what? You know what? I, I think he got even there, I, you know, for sure. Um, now, but look, I mean, the three percenters, the proud boys, 
the Oath Keepers, and I don't know whatever other ones. There are some that are quite a bit further to the right than these guys. Of course, the Department of Justice and the FBI ride herd on these guys as close as they can at all times, threaten them with long prison terms in order to turn them into informants against each other, as they always have done against the radical right and the radical left uh, in this country. So the idea that you would have a bunch of federal informants at the Capitol as you said, this is just basic logic. That's your starting point. The question is, which one of these guys are informants? Are they acting really as provocateurs? Are they getting away with bloody murder because of a relationship with the cops? Or the cops put them up to this or to that? These are all fair questions. The right. only thing that's unreasonable is to just jump to conclusions. But that's not what you're doing. So that's beside the point. Right. I'm not jumping to conclusions. And again... Uh, just like getting very specific in the case of Stuart Rhodes, if somebody can provide a reasonable alternative explanation for number one, why they didn't hit him with a lesser conspiracy charge like they did with Caldwell right off the bat or a trespassing charge like they did with others, Owen Schroyer, <laughs> Mark Ibrahim, right off the bat. And then just build their case after, you know, as he's been indicted on a lesser charge and use that for additional leverage as they build their bigger seditious conspiracy case. If someone can explain to me why they didn't do that, number one, and why they this guy that they were so interested in and so worried about and so meticulous about that they needed to spend a whole year building a case before they did anything, why on top of that, they wouldn't even bother to search him, they would give him four months to destroy evidence, and then an additional eight months after looking at a single phone. If someone can explain those things in mm -hmm. some alternative explanation that is not he was being protected on the basis of some relationship with a federal agency, I am fully and honestly and genuinely willing to entertain that. But I haven't heard anything that comes remotely, remotely close to satisfactorily accounting for those things that is not the hypothesis that I've advanced. Yeah, I want to go back to something that you said last time on the show, which was when people read these articles, who is Ray Epps 1 and 2 at Revolver News there, you got to watch the YouTubes embedded in the footage yes. there and look at this footage with your own eyes and see. The video 90% of the lifting, if not 95%. Yeah. So I'm interested most in the guy that cut down the fencing and then took the metal poles for the temporary fencing and wiggled them until they were loose and pulled them out of the ground and then went and hid all that stuff out of the way so that people who were just getting there would have no idea they're even walking onto so-called restricted space at all at that time. That guy's so far unindicted, correct? Yeah, no, I mean, there, there are other people who seem to coordinate with Epps to effect that first decisive initial breach at 12.53 p.m. Uh, you're referring to the fence cutter guy who just coolly and methodically cuts the fences. There's another guy that I'm actually more interested Which, in. Which, by the way, I'm not sitting here pining for anyone to go to jail. I'm just interested in who these guys are and what happened. Yeah, well. look, you know, that's another thing I'd like to clarify. People are saying, oh, great, yeah, great stuff. Stuart Rose is arrested. I'm not looking for these guys to go in jail. I don't want anyone to go in jail. I think the whole thing is ridiculous. But when I see egregious, selective non-prosecution and uh, just profoundly different standards for someone like Caldwell and someone like Epps, someone like Caldwell, someone like Rhodes, and I have the context that I do, I demand an explanation for this and the the remark of oh you know this person wasn't indicted for a year or oh Ray Epps isn't indicted that isn't like saying please indict him to satisfy my need for these people to be indicted no what what I need to be satisfied is the questions of why these people received one kind of treatment whereas the other people received a vastly different type of treatment and that's what I seek to answer and even for the case of Rhodes and Epps. I have no, you know, vendetta against these guys. I think that they are pawns in a much larger thing. I think they themselves may have been manipulated, even deceived by whoever their handlers were. And I think there's still a redemption arc that's possible for these people. Again, if they come forward and say, look, 
I was used, I was manipulated. Here's what I know. And here's what the American public needs to know. Yeah, fair enough. Sounds like to me. Um, And look, especially for the big deal that's being made out of this by the Congress, by, you know, the center right and the Democratic left there, uh, where this is, you know, the the greatest thing that, uh, you know, the biggest, worst thing by great is what exactly. I mean. You know? Like this the great the worst war thing since nine 11. Yeah. They compared the it directly. One... I mean, in, in many cases said it was worse than nine 11. So this is worse than nine 11, worse than Pearl Harbor. And yet for some reason, the only guy who's on video repeatedly saying we need to go into the Capitol <laughs> is untouched. And, and again, just a, a quick, quick points on the damage control tour of apps. First of all, they went through his his lawyer, his lawyer, incidentally, and again, this might mean nothing, but his lawyer is a former FBI guy who worked for 10 years um, for the Phoenix field office, and I think another field office. He's a 10-year FBI guy, literally, which would be a hilarious troll on Epps's part. So I have to like tip my hat to that. But yeah, his his lawyer is a for, is a 10-year FBI guy, and his his through his lawyer. I guess spoke to the you know January 6th committee. Apparently Epps talked to them in November. We're supposed to be satisfied by this statement that we don't even have the exact statement. We don't know what the circumstances are for the statement, whether it was under oath or what. And the statement is carefully worded to the extent that it's given to the public through you know hearsay and not even directly. And the 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 statement seems to lean very heavily on the notion that. Epps never worked for a law enforcement agency. Well, I think it's another opportunity to clarify that this isn't necessarily about the FBI. You know, there are a a number of other organizations in the United States federal government that could be complicit here that are not technically speaking law enforcement. And he could be an informant without ever being paid a dime. And they could sit there and say, well, he wasn't working yep. for us. I mean, we were just going to put him in prison that, if he didn't do what we said. That's all. There are a lot of arrangements that could sustain this, assuming they're going by the book and just not lying, which is, of course, a possibility. The but best part of that, to, though, was all the fact checkers saying this is now an established fact, like right, the sun is, is round because <laughs> it's we heard that his lawyer right. said that to the Congress, and that'll be good right. enough for you, they announced. Right, right. This, yeah, this, he's debunked because his former <laughs> FBI agent lawyer said under, maybe under oath, maybe not under oath, and we don't have the exact statement, said that he never worked for a law enforcement agency, which of course leaves open the possibility that it was something run out of the Department of Defense, maybe Army counterintelligence cut out, maybe it was Department of Homeland Security, maybe it was this, maybe or that, maybe it was some kind of contract work that was a cutout of multiple degrees removed from whoever was running it, you know, but it's debunked because the, the lawyer says he, he never worked for a law enforcement agency. And that's how the media reports it, by the way. Um, so that's kind of what we're dealing with, uh, which is kind of ridiculous and, and sad, frankly. But, um, you know, of course, we're going to watch this very closely and monitor how all of this plays out for unforced errors, which I think they will surely make. And we will do everything we can to exploit those unforced errors in order to further bring the truth um, to the American public. Great. All right, you guys, that's Darren Beatty. He is at revolver.news. And check out both of them. It's really worth your time. Who is Ray Epps? One and two. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. The Scott Horton Show, Anti War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.